Light Institute and the Sanctuary of Light welcome each and all of you to this time of knowings and invite you to bring forward the questions of your heart so that through our conversations we can create a ripple out of knowing into this world all of the thousands of people who feel the same way we do uh, and who are listening. So please, don't be bashful. We'd like to begin. Yeah. I want to hear about forgiveness. Um, I know that we cannot know the effects of our actions. For instance, we may do something wonderful like give someone the cab that's come for us and it could take them away to a tragedy that they might have missed otherwise. So I know that we have to go inside to our intention. Nevertheless, we hurt other people and they hurt us. And we're taught to ask for forgiveness or to give forgiveness. We're even taught to pray for forgiveness. But I don't quite understand what it is that we're asking for or why we seem to need it so strongly. Well, take a deep breath because you probably will be surprised at my answer. <laughs> I hope so. Because <laughs> all the ones I've been going over haven't been working for me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because forgiveness is, is some kind of misconception of the dance of relationship, of our dance of connecting into the world. It is not your fault you give a cab and somebody is, and tragically goes to their death. Of course, forgiveness is the conversation of the self. And that's why it's fine to say, I am I am sorry. You know, uh, we can say, I made a mistake. I am sorry. We can feel those kinds of energies inside ourselves. But when we ask from the outside, first of all, we presume that we have hurt, that we have that much power over other people. People are often hurt because they feel that's what they deserve, so they set it up unconsciously to be hurt, for you to say an unkind word, or for uh, you not to choose them. Uh, they may have chosen you, so you wouldn't choose them. So my conversation about forgiveness is that we cannot know, as you said, we cannot know the dance on a spiritual and cosmic level. And because of that, because we cannot see the ripples that are outside time, uh, past incarnations are not past, they're going on now with the same people. So asking for forgiveness is a way of beating the breast and s staying within a, a vibration of uh, regret and negative energies. What we want to do is to say, I can do it better. Let me extend light to this person. Let me extend light to myself. Let me shift this reality and go on. Rather than obsess in ourselves that we should have done it better, that we should have done this or this or this, because we cannot see the purpose from our limited perspective of anything, life, death, love, separation, embrace, we cannot see it. And so I think the whole planet needs to be lifted above the conversation of forgiveness. What religions mean when they talk about that is what they really mean is pay attention to the law of karma, of cause and effect, action and reaction, and contemplate, be conscious of your choices so that you always uphold the best in you. When you uphold the best in you, even if it's something that... Um, is momentarily um, disappointing to someone else, it will help them to grow. So intent is not a thought form. Intention is um, woven within the fabric of, of connection. And so our intent uh, can always be for the good of the whole, for myself and others. But when we are beating our breasts and thinking because it's infinite how many things you could ask for forgiveness for. <laughs> uh, consciously, unconsciously intending to do it, not intending to do it. We need to not waste our lives on, whoops, it didn't come out the way I wanted it to. We need to uphold in our lives 
the beauty of the love that we can work with. We all need to learn to love better, how to love uh, more deeply, to uh, love longer. Uh, and as we work with those things, uh, we can begin to feel the pleasure and the peace of knowing that we are truly good. So again, if you've hurt somebody's feelings, uh, I would always say, there is a way out. You know, and the way out is to, instead of in your mind, say, I'm the bad guy, won't you forgive me? But here's what I have to offer to that. At every moment within our lives, we have the power to shift the energies. So if something in negative has come through you, or around you, or from you, at any moment when you have the recognition of that, you have the power to say, what frequency of light, which is cosmic language, do you need from me to come into balance and harmony in my life and release us both from the karma? Because you are probably the pawn in their movie anyway. And then as you draw that color, you listen to the color that pops into your consciousness. When you draw that frequency of light in, into your emotional body and radiate it out to them, you will find that yourself uplifts that you begin to be um, free of seeing how um, the illusion of our breakability, you know, of how delicate we are. We're not that delicate. <laughs> We're not that delicate at all. If, if our words hurt each other, it isn't, I'm not saying we should just go ahead and throw things at each other. What I'm saying is that um, if our words hurt each other, uh, then there is, again, a confusion on a spiritual level that someone has that power over you. And the reason that we give people that power is that we think we deserve the punishment. We think no one's going to choose us, no one's going to love us, um, that we are unworthy, etc., etc. Because we have been taught that, it's been brought down through the psychogenetics, eons of time, of our unworthiness as humans, as beings in body rather than the grace and the power of the soul to choose to be in body for the evolution of the soul. And in that evolution, uh, we have the right to fall on our faces every once in a while. Uh, and to know that, again, how do we balance that? We balance it from above. We can't balance it through the mind. We can't say, oh, I didn't mean to do that. It's done. What you have to mix into that is a divine energy, a higher frequency. And as we bring that higher frequency in, it reconfigures the purpose and the outcome. It reconfigures the past and the future. So you really want to release yourself from all of the please forgive me and feel the, the gift and the smile of, here, let me give you this. Let me give you this, because what you give is so much more important than something that slipped through the cracks, cracks someplace. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So be of light heart. <laughs> yes. On that note, do you feel that we can completely change things that we've done in the past? Of course, yes. of course we can yes. change the past. Because whenever our consciousness moves into a different frequency, uh, there, that will cause a sleeping, that will cause a dying of something that's living, even in the thought forms or the actions or the consciousness of another person. If you're not there stimulating the repetition, it will go away. The thing that we have to recognize is that the emotional body does not have time and space. So it repeats and it repeats, and if you won't keep doing it with me, I'll just look around and find somebody else who will do it with me. And everyone knows that pattern. If you simply stop for a moment and think about the relationships you have. So can we change the past? We, how do we do it? We do it by changing ourselves, by shifting octaves. If you're up here, all of this doesn't exist anymore. Because this is what is true for you. So that would erase the forgiveness need, and it would erase the guilt. 
Absolutely. And so many people suffer through. A absolutely. And again, if you erase it from your consciousness, then whoever your karmic partner is, it will go out of their consciousness as well. Right. And that's the beauty and the dance of relationship that we have on this planet. So guilt and the need for forgiveness and all of those conversations are are really a confusion and they are a way of uh, holding our unworthiness. I, and this is simply isn't cosmic truth. It's just not cosmic truth. So, of course we want to be compassionate. Of course we want to always choose in a, in a difficult situation. Perhaps someone's attacking you and you strike out at them. In a difficult situation, the more that we wield the light, the easier it is for us to move aside. You know, all of the ancient martial arts are based on this capacity, you know, to move aside. If you're not sitting in the middle of the road, it's not going to run over you. And so it is, in the, in the end, truly our choice, how we react and what we offer. And so we want to come to a place where if somebody is attacking you, your consciousness can be, what's happening to you? Can't be me. <laughs> it can't be me. Because I'm a loving being, so what's happening to you? The moment you put your attention on them is what we call the piercing of the heart. You're moving past the shield, past the mask, from the anger to the fear to the hurt inside them. Then you have the power to ignore whatever attack is coming to you and offer something back that's healing to them. And it's really amazing how quickly people shift. Uh, when they realize that they don't have a sparring partner. And that partner is never you. Question. So this morning I woke up with a thirst for the inner experience of being internal. And up until now I thought I had been, you know, within that conversation and, and being connected to it. So it's kind of surprising, it was a very distinct, just like it would be a thirst for water or hunger for food, it was very distinct communication saying inward, inward, inward. And so it coincides with um, taking care of my adrenals. I mean, I just started taking these herbs four days ago. So I'm asked, wanting to know how much does the inner connect to the physical body and the hormones and the adrenals and so much? And, and what happens when we are, you know, in stressful situations and we get pushed out and what, where does the spiritual or the inner response come from and, and can it come if, it's not, if you're not being fed? Mm -hmm. so that's my question. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a lovely question and has multiple yeah. angles to it. <laughs> Let me see where to start. So, first of all, remember that the, that the adrenals are uh, a part of the endocrine system, they're a part of that conversation uh, that does support hormonal energy, does support all of those other activities within the physical body because the adrenals and the physical body on a cellular level, on a source level, are made of light. And so um, usually the adrenals will uh, be calling to you or, or be stressed uh, because there is no nourishment on the deeper levels. Uh, there's a level of fear in terms of the self that's coming there. The adrenals respond uh, almost instantly uh, to a little exercise which I will do. I was tickled the other day because uh, I, I was uh, exploring, testing out the adrenals, um, the acupuncture pulses, you know, and my kidneys and my adrenals were perfect, and I had to smile because I had just been with a client, and I was showing them the adrenal exercise. And so I was doing it as well, and then two hours, uh, no, the next morning, I guess it was, when I was testing, mine were perfect because I had done that. So it's wonderful to realize that within ourselves, we have all of the answers. Uh, hunger is never an external thing. Um, emotional eating, um, the symbolism of eating for comfort, uh, it's all wrapped up in sense of survival. It's all wrapped up in a sense of self. And so uh, 
when we have a hunger for something, whether it's an idea or it's a food, uh, it's something that is has a point of reference inside ourselves. And what I would say to you is, first of all, feeling that you are connected on the inner levels, remember that the inner levels are not static. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're not who you were yesterday. Your divine energy is not the same as it was yesterday. Um, going within it will look nothing like going within yesterday. One day you may have a profound meditation of absolute bliss and silence. The next day you may giggle all the way through, I am meditating. Uh, because it, you are alive. Because everything is moving. And so the beauty of that is to rediscover ourselves. When you have this go within, you only have it because that which you hunger for is already in you. You're about to have an aha. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually get hungry unless we have the smell of food, unless we have a point of reference somewhere. So something as you woke up, uh, some aspect of a dream was already connected to something deep. And it was just saying, come back, go in. And, uh, and that's what you want to follow in so that you don't set for yourself this is who I am and this is what that looks like because it looks differently each time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, we can be in very stressful situations and not stress our adrenals. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and the answer to that is a little bit complicated for this moment, but it has to do with truly experiencing that we will always survive. Mm -hmm that no one's anger, that no one's words, that no one's actions will uh, end us. But that we have this sense of uh, carrying out our purpose, of, of living life so that the unmanifest can take in the vibration. Because that is the way of cosmic law of energy. It goes out and it comes in. And that can mean taking it from the cosmos, extending it out and having it come back through to you. So, uh, I think when you, ha when you suddenly need to be within, it's because there's something whispering, there's something awaiting you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so often, we're waiting for the big bang, you know? We think if we're going to meditate, something big is going to happen, or if we do this or that. Uh, it isn't that way. So often, it is the quietest flicker that comes from the higher self uh, while we are multitasking, while we are doing something else. So often people suffer um, because they feel that they can't be the true selves because they have to be in, the, in this world. They have to fill up their lives with daily stuff. If we recognize that every act, daily stuff, uh, is the opportunity to profoundly enhance the soul's wisdom, through the grace with which we do everything, or the grace with which we come to everything. Even if we come to a crisis situation and at that moment we don't have the answer, or we can't find the answer. Uh, this is, again, the gift of life. Because we will find the answer, we always find some answer, and that is the propulsion of our growth. So, let us practice this adrenal uh, exercise. The adrenals are small P-shaped uh, organs that sit on top of our kidneys and our kidneys are the deepest energy in our body. They hold our ancestral chi. That means that psychogenetically all the fears, all the imprints, all of the truths of your great, great, great grandparents are encoded into your kidneys and pushed into the adrenals. So, we do this little friction just to activate, activate the energies. Now, just blow on your hands. That's good. Now, put your hands behind your back where your ribcage is. And now, just begin to breathe in through your hands and ask your adrenals what frequency of light they need to come into perfect physiological, spiritual balance the first color that pops into your consciousness and imagine that you're sucking it in through your own hands, that your own healing hands are directing that light 
precisely into your adrenals to nourish them, to support them to put out the hormones that support your life, to not be putting out cortisol, the death hormone, but to be in absolute balance. So just breathe that color in, and as you breathe it into your adrenals, imagine if your adrenals had a face and they could smile at you. So just breathe that in until you fill up your adrenals and you can feel that relaxation, the sensation of a smile. Take a deep breath and open your eyes. Release your hands. It's such a simple exercise, but like so many things that we can do that can absolutely change the channels of energy in our body. The only problem is, you have to do it. You have to do it. <laughs> in one of my books, The Ageless Body, I gave uh, a whole complex of adrenals, or, or of the endocrine glands, just so that you could send color to them. But you have to stick that up on the wall someplace, or put it on top of your bed so that you do it when you go to bed at night. You have to do something to remember to do it. That's, that's the conversation. And when we are doing that, again, you're, you're choosing to dissolve fear. Because fear is at the base of our anxiety and our stress. Because fear is what contracts and whispers to us, maybe I can't, maybe it won't. Uh, how can I? And so, by just sending light, you can shut down that conversation. Thank you for that question. It's so important to all of us. What else? Um, I was wondering about religions. I remember when I was in Iran, you were at that uh, subject, comparative religions. Yes. And, um, you know, since you know everybody is talking about the various different religions nowadays, I was wondering what is it in the various different religions that is a seed for us that we can use and how can we transcend the religions that we have right now to something that can actually nurture everybody. That's a lovely conversation. I would say that the, the core of it is to recognize that we are made of divine stuff. Now, most religions would deny that, but they would say there is a God. So what is the crux of all religions? God. Now, of course, at Nijoni in the Lion's Duke, we don't use that word. We would say the divine source. There is that spark. And it, what it means in religions is, uh, and all religions in whichever way they do, are saying to the people how to live, which is take your attention off of yourself, uh, become a part of the whole, a part of your community, a part of your church, a part of your family, a part of your country, whatever it is, but allow your life to be a life that offers service, uh, a life that uh, upholds the highest teachings of anybody's God. And basically, as I did that Evolution of God book and read all of the sacred texts, basically the teachings were all the same. You know, we think that the Christians came up with the uh, Ten Commandments. I remember I put 12 <laughs> new ones in my book, the Ten Commandments. In actuality, every religion has their own variation of that. What should we do? What should we not do? And of course, the Ten Commandments are about what you shouldn't do. So it's time to, to come to a recognition, which is, if I am a divine being, what are uh, the, the principles that I would live by? And again, all religions really have the same ones uh, that have to do with honesty and truth and love and uh, compassion uh, for the self and others. Now, you know, when I wrote that book, I certainly opportuned uh, death threats, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I wrote the book, I never was afraid that someone would attack me for saying, well, you know, this isn't really ultimate truth. This is just something somebody told you because it's convenient for the, for the uh, laws of that religion. The reason I never had fear was that I always knew 
that I could talk to anyone, any um, violent person about their religion uh, and find a place where we could come together. And the way that my higher self taught me to do that was to say, tell me, teach me, what is the thing that you most love, that most inspires you about your religion? And as they say that, then of course I can say, me too. I feel the same way. We are alike. And so when we come together, instead of my God against your God, with the tenets of all religions, which are about how to live in a community, uh, how to take care of each other, how to honor God, uh, it's very easy, really, to uh, honor the divine source through our lives. And especially if you can get rid of forgiveness and guilt and sin and all of those um, illusions uh, that take the place and fill up our attention instead of the love and the compassion and the humor and the gestures and the service uh, and the giving and all of those things that are really humans' innate uh, desires. And so I, I really feel, and it's very important, because in today's world, and certainly on this day, 9-11, uh, the echo of uh, the fanaticism that exists in the world, how we are right and you are wrong and we will bring you down, uh, it, it doesn't need to have a place. But we have to let go of the deliciousness of revenge. And uh, again, something that I love in doing incarnational work is that follow anyone's experience back a few, a few points of incarnation and you will see a different balance. For example, the Tibetans a few hundred years ago, they were warriors. They went out and killed people. And so what have they learned? Never kill people. You know, be passive. Uh, but there's a cause and effect there. There's a cause and effect. Uh, the Christians went out and called the Muslims the infidels uh, and uh, invited the, the noble knights uh, to have wealth and a place in heaven if they would just go out and slaughter them all, the Jews and the, and the Muslims. And so now the Muslims few hundred years later, saying, oh, the infidels, <laughs> those guys, those Christians over there, they don't know God. And so it goes, back and forth and back and forth. It's for us to stop that. And the way we can stop it is to actually find out, to actually, if there are being people of other religions around, to, to reach out. If we really cared, we would find out. Uh, because even though when you read the sacred books, and I mean all the sacred books, they are so filled with conversations that had to do with how to live for the people at that time in those places. That has nothing to do with today. But by the same token, uh, if you read those texts, you could find something that would inspire you. Some point of uh, recognition that would allow you to feel as if uh, you are a good person, that you are a, uh, a divine, a godly person. And so we need to cross the barriers. Uh, you know, uh, the basic tenets that I learned of cross-cultural understanding in the Peace Corps would serve all religions and all governments very well. If you're going to have refugees from another religion, another race, another country coming to your country, you have to reach out. And it's amazing to me how now here we are, uh, and all of these countries that have brought in these refugees are now in absolute rebellion against them. Why? Because the refugees are all over in their corner, and the other guys are all over in their corner, each one saying, what is mine? And who's going to tell me what is true? And. Uh, so we have to take responsibility for our part in separation, our part in the illusion of right and wrong, uh, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. 
And even from where we sit here, uh, and we're going to do that right now, uh, to look out at some other religion. I'm sure every one of you has at least one that you could look at that you don't trust, that you feel uncomfortable uh, with, so that you can feel the energy of extending something that crosses the barrier of judgment and fear and separation, so that you can make that connection that will allow you to be less afraid and to go on. So please close your eyes. Take a deep breath into your body and ask your own higher self to show you a religious group uh, with whom you are um, at odds, that you do not trust, that you feel wary of, that you do not know or not want to know. Hmm. See who you get. Bring them into your mind's eye and ask them what frequency of light, divine cosmic language, they need from you in order to dissolve the line of separation, in order to come into balance and harmony and be released from thousands of years of back and forth and back and forth. Just listen. What is the color that comes to you? Draw that color from the cosmos down through the top of your head and radiate it out to that group. Radiate, radiate it out to them and extend it out into their churches, quote, or their, their temples or their places of worship. Because my higher self is just showing me that most of our uh, places of worshiping or coalescing our religious dogma are filled with so much negativity. So we deeply continue drawing that light down and extend it out to them, to those places that hold their vibrations and thoughts and feelings. And take a deep breath and open your eyes. Sometimes we are afraid of other religious groups. We don't even know why we are. For example, I got some headhunters. <laughs> and saw them very clearly. And I know that that's because in the primordial soup of the divine, uh, there was a, definitely a difference of opinion about what is acceptable, what is, what is uh, your right to do or to choose. Uh, so sometimes it could be not only uh, that your great-grandfather was murdered by some religion, or it could be you from another lifetime who destroyed someone from that religion. Uh, and so both those, uh, being the victim and the victimizer, bring you to a place of incredible discomfort. Uh, a willingness to look at them and say, well, but this and this and this and this is the reason when we actually don't know what the source is. And that's why at the Light Institute we feel it's so important uh, to explore many incarnations. And especially when those kinds of themes come up, my God against your God, uh, to explore what's the source of that so that we don't carry it and most importantly, we don't pass it on. In the book, The Evolution of God, I have a chapter where you can write down where you got particular uh, religious beliefs. And it's very interesting to do that exercise because so often, again, uh, you have been imprinted with other people's fears or thoughts, and you're not even aware of it. You think, I have no problem with anybody. But when you start, from whom did you first 
uh, fear God? From whom did you first uh, look at another religion and say them as opposed to us? Uh, you start to see a completely different picture of what you're actually holding within your genetic encoding and your emotional body. So it's very important for us to go inside and explore these conversations to set ourselves free. Again, if you set yourself free, even if you don't have children of your own, you will create a vibration in the ethers that will allow many people down into the future to be free from that conversation. It's so hard for us to get that you're the pyramid, you're the, you're the apex of the pyramid of all the people that you know and that are connected to you. And how each one of them as they go with their families and their world, how, how incredibly infinite is that hologram of influence and impregnation of concepts that you would consciously be horrified uh, to claim as your own. So thank you very much. Want to tell us who you got? Um, I got um, a, a Catholic group of, yes. of people uh, who were very, very, very strict and very stubborn. Yes. Um, which surprised me because I grew up Catholic and I yes. didn't have that kind of image, but yes. I know there are groups like that. Yes. Like that. So, um, that's a group I got. And what was the color they needed from you? Um, purple. A violet? Purple. 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 Great. Fantastic. Yeah. See, so that's a perfect example of how we're not aware of something. You've never even maybe thought about groups like that or you knew they existed but it didn't mean anything to you. But it might have meant something, meant something to some relative in the past or you in another incarnation of your soul, another lifetime. And so listen to the words you said, stubborn. You know, that stubbornness. Stubbornness always gets us into trouble. <laughs> and, to, and what do we mean by that? They're right and everybody else is wrong and therefore they have permission to punish themselves, punish somebody else, etc., etc. Look at the extreme of that. Here in New Mexico, we still have the penitentes. Yeah. People who whip themselves and beat themselves uh, to punish themselves for uh, sins because they're, because they're alive. And it's not too long ago that it was rumored that here in New Mexico there was even a crucifixion. Not so long ago. So those kinds of groups uh, do exist. And uh, again, what is the basis for the fanaticism of those kind of groups? It's always fear. It's always survival. It's always that exaggeration of a human element that's in our DNA, which is, I must belong. I do not exist if I do not belong. And this is true in the old tribal systems um, throughout the world. If you have no formal place, you could be put out, put to death, um, left alone, starved, etc., etc. So it's an old, old, old echo. And so uh, when we fight for our team, my team, <laughs> uh, whether it's football or whatever it is, or, or my religion, or my race, or my whatever, underneath it all is going to be in you. I'm not enough unless I have all this power around me and I can suck in this power and therefore I am safe. And so at this time, in having the consciousness that we have on the planet, we have the opportunity to not only release ourselves from the conversation of safety, but to find the way through the armor and the fear of others to help to whisper to them, you are yourself. You are yourself, and you will be safe. So thank you. What else? I was a comment about that, that um, our political parties, that's what I got. Yes. Was, was the uh, kind of the right-wing conservative um, Republicans, mm -hmm. particularly Michelle Bachman. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking at her, and then I got an image of Ron Paul, mm -hmm. and, um, and it just made me think about how politics has become a new kind of religion. Absolutely. And that, and that you know, well we, we, especially over here, and I think it's becoming more so in the world, that we really align ourselves with a particular, very narrow,
political viewpoint, regardless of whether our policies are going to work, we just say, this is who I am, this is my um, point of reference to the world. And I think it's interesting mm -hmm. because and what I saw with Michelle Bachman was her as a, it, it was instant, I saw her as a Egyptian high priest, mm -hmm. and I saw Ron Paul as a serving maid. <laughs> and it kind of made sense. Maid. Of what, yeah. <laughs> maid, yeah. Maid, mm -hmm. female. And, mm -hmm. and Michelle Bachman was a, a, a priest, should I say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just made me realize that when we have these political leaders, how much of that story, you know, their incarnations, they're playing out, and they're actually not necessarily present yeah. to what's actually the current exactly. um, currency. And that comes back to my higher self's statement that truth is what we experience. And so in those kinds of situations, whatever your financial view is, whatever, who's taking care of you, who's promising you something, you align to that because of survival, because of some old, uh, something that you have no awareness of. And so it is a religion, and it is uh, to the extreme, this is right, mm -hmm. not just right wing, but mm -hmm. right, and, and therefore godly, and everyone else is wrong, and, and never mind them. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever we experience is our truth. And what happens to most people because of the way the emotional body functions is whatever their experiences that have to do with survival or success are, and they never broaden that view. They never widen the circle. They just keep repeating and repeating. Mm -hmm. So that is the only thing they can see. And so the, that is that profound alignment with a group or a person, a, a political leader. Uh, and why do we do it? Because we think, in a very religious way, mm -hmm. that they're going to save us. Mm -hmm. That they are the only saviors of our system, our daily lives, our world. You know? And it's time for all of us to come to the recognition of the self, the sense of self, so that we will carry the responsibility with joy and adventure that we are not asking, not God, not the government, not a political structure, not our communities, not our lovers, not our children, to save us. But that, indeed, the purpose of our life is to contribute, not follow. Thank you. I was just going to say along that idea of, of the propensity of the mind to just keep going around the same groove, keep rec recreating the same experience. Yes. That given this time of earth changes, the uh, power of thought to manifest our daily experiences and events for ourselves seems to be much magnified over what it was even 20 or 30 years ago. And this whole tendency that we have to not, re not imagine anything we haven't already imagined, not to think thoughts that we've never thought before, <laughs> um, not yes. to sort of step out, um, has to do less with intention and more with habit. Absolutely. mental habit mm -hmm. and that's why I was wondering if you might have a suggestion for a way for all individuals to open and encourage the mind to imagine things it has not previously imagined and mm -hmm. to think thoughts it's not previously thought and be safe with that, okay with that and even in understanding that to practice with the manifestation of, say, starting with smaller things to realize that we can and do manifest these things, limited mostly by our inability, as you've indicated, to understand what do I want. Mm -hmm. And I keep getting sort of the sense of the reason we have trouble with what do I want is because we've already been down the available menu. That's right, <laughs> well said. And just kind of, yeah, we've never done that. Yeah. So, I don't want any of that. It would seem what would be necessary now is the ability to imagine entrees yes. on a menu that have never been available That's to right. us before. <laughs> so beautiful, so beautiful. Let me start with, I would say, uh, a really basic conversation that we've been having, which is that we give everyone around us the power. So we, we look out and we say, well, those are the bad guys, etc., etc., mm -hmm. The way through that would be, as I was saying, 
extend your consciousness to them and find the good in them. Find a quality that they have that's wonderful. Or find uh, what is causing them pain or hurt. And extend your energy to that. When you can imagine someone else, your whole world begins to expand. The Native Americans said it very well when they said, walk a mile in my moccasins and you will know me. So if we were to begin to, uh, instead of see everyone out here, we begin to extend ourselves so that we engage in the conversation it would allow for us to begin to imagine different things, to be able to see. The problem with those kinds of conversations is that our habit, our mental habit, is to, uh, to be intelligent and see the possible bad things first, mm -hmm. to see the danger. And so our mind spins on the danger. So what we want to do, beginning with other humans, is to look for and imagine the good. Imagine being friends with someone who frightens you, for example. You know, uh, imagine something positive in that way. And then begin to, without even thinking of what you want, because as, as you're pointing out, that I pointed out, people cannot figure out what they want. But to start with something simple. Um, I wish it would rain today. Good. Imagine it raining, as we do in, in all of our meditations here. Or, I really need a vacation. Uh, imagine yourself on vacation. Imagine yourself not having to react or, re or, or respond to anything outside you. What would happen? So, just beginning to imagine something. This is very mundane, I'm bringing up here. The very simple, uh, imagine yourself being healthy. Uh, imagine uh, receiving a gift. So many people feel, oh, I have to give everyone else, I have to take care of everyone else, and no one sees me. Imagine a scenario in which the world is seeing you or giving you a gift. So that you can begin to actually have all these lifetimes at once through each little scenario, uh, each little vignette, vignette that you create. Uh, so that every time you imagine something, you are stretching uh, the neurotransmitters in your brain. You are, you are regenerating your brain. So imagination is very crucial. This is why children learn so quickly. Because they can imagine. They don't have the voice saying, that's not true. Or, yeah, but remember what that guy did last time? No, they're, they're not doing that. They're simply imagining something. And they're putting themselves in the scenario. So if we want to um, stretch our mental box or be out of that box, then we have to imagine something that we wouldn't think of normally. And so, look around at your life. What, is the, what are the habitual things that you do? Imagine yourself doing something else. You know? Imagine yourself not getting up in the morning and going to work. Not that I'm suggesting you don't. <laughs> On the other hand, imagine yourself going into work and spewing such powerful energy, so it's happy energy, that everyone uh, gets healthy, that everyone is happy, that you, that you feel that you belong and you love that group. I, I think it's so important because most people spend more time with the people at work mm -hmm. than they do with their children, with their family, with their partners. And so we don't, uh, we usually move to the bottom and whenever there's a group of people, you know, it's always about who bugs us at work, who's <laughs> sabotaging us, whose fault is it, etc. And what if we went to work and we had a different attitude? So we have to even begin. What what is it, what does happiness look like? What is an attitude of manifestation? What is it like? Can you imagine it? Can you imagine what your face would look like? if you just manifested something that you wanted? Pretty happy. Pretty happy. <laughs> and what would that look like? Your eyes would widen. Your, your, your smile would widen. No, uh, we need to smile in our sleep. Uh, I've been with a lot of newborn babies. 
they smile in their, in their sleep. Now, doctors say that's because they're digesting. <laughs> no, 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 no. They're smiling in their sleep. They might not be si smiling about anything you know about. They might be smiling about something that isn't here in this dimension, but they are smiling. And so there are a trillion ways for us to break that, that habitual mental conversation. Um, I would say even in your body, uh, and walk backwards. Uh, these are things that, that will actually make your brain swell, make your brain bigger and, and rejuvenate itself. Walking backwards, uh, wiggling your fingers, weaving your fingers together. Uh, most people, when they go up and down steps, will always lead with one foot. In the middle of the steps, turn around and lead with the other foot. That simple action, physical action, action will stimulate your brain. And so there are many ways to, to shift our perceptions. Because what you're talking about is perception, really. Uh, and, of course, we only feel safe with the perceptions that are going to protect us. And so I think that this is why I love beauty so much. Because when we focus on beauty, when we see something that we really love, maybe it's a color, maybe it's a flower, maybe it's a painting, maybe it's a car, when, whatever we see that's beautiful to us, it relaxes our body, it deepens our breath, uh, it allows us to connect. It allows us to go away for a moment from, I can't have that, uh, the other guy has it, the jealousy, all of those negative conversations, but for a moment, being a part of those energies. And so all it takes, as I said in the beginning tonight, is choosing to do it. And you can do it while you're driving, you can do it while you're walking. Um, you take one point of reference and you spin a whole story around it. You, know? you can look at a flower and begin to imagine uh, the bee that, that pollinated it, etc., etc., etc. There's no end to how we can play with uh, things that make us uh, inspired, that make us feel that positive outcomes are available to us. A positive outcome cannot come to you if you can't see it. Mm -hmm. It'll come right by you. <laughs> and you'll see it just as it's going on. <laughs> Oops, I missed that chance. You missed the chance because you were looking for the negative. Because you weren't willing to say, bring it. Bring it to me. So thank you. That's really, really a wonderful point of reference to let go of our physical patterns, addictions, and habits, our emotional patterns, our mental patterns. Because in the end, it is the mind, the infinite mind, that constructs reality. I've worked uh, with people who are, quote, mentally ill, and I can assure you that this is true. Now, what you're holding in your mind is your reality. And so, let us uh, take up the uh, staff of truth and hold what we want in our minds. Thank you. Thank you. What else? Yes. Can you talk about the difference between community and tribe? Yes. Well, community is just a modern-day word for tribe. Uh, we have lost a lot of the good qualities of tribes, because in tribes you had a place. You never stepped out of line. You never had to risk anything because you knew who you were, uh, which was not much. So the tribes, tribes were much more, and uh, they were not individuated. Communities are based on perhaps likeness of mind, uh, but, but much more individuation. You don't necessarily live together, eat together, breathe together. Uh, uh, a family could be a tribe. A neighborhood would be a community, for example. And, uh, of course, the negative, I'm always pointing out the negative aspects of tribes, which is no individuation, no sense of individuality itself uh, that could amplify what you have to give to the whole. Now, in tribes, you were bound to give. 
you were the, the cooker, the cleaner, the hunter, the, the warrior, the whatever you were. Uh, and that was the purpose of your life. So it was simple. Uh, life was peaceful on that level because you didn't have any kind of internal conversation. In communities, uh, we talk about communion, talk about uh, connecting to each other, um, uh, but we always can feel that, that there's an effort in that. There's definitely an effort in that. And the, effort, the difference, I would say, between a tribe and a community is the word trust. It's easy to trust a tribe. We are all bred alike. You know, we're looking at the reflection of the self. It would never occur to you not to trust the leader of the tribe, the, the uh, healer of the tribe, the priest of the tribe, the, the um, children of the tribe. Trust would not be an issue. In community, you would want to trust, but you would have to have some uh, confirmation. So there's a lot more modern day stuff in community. Uh, and the beauty, though, is in community, you can come and be communal, and then you can go away and nourish yourself or have another reality that supports you. That's never true in a tribe. And so it allows us to return to whatever point that is within us that nourishes us, that rejuvenates us, that allows us to be peaceful. Maybe that's to go to your own home. Maybe it's to dig in your garden. Maybe it's to meditate. Uh, by yourself, maybe it's uh, to sing in the shower, but you have something that's yours that, that brings that alignment and then you go back to the community and you participate, you commune. And uh, so I think community is a wonderful thing because it allows us the freedom that tribes never, never offer. And again, uh, survival is based in a tribe with trusting and uh, uh, participating in the way that is given to you. You're not choosing it, it's given to you. In communities, you might be the one that comes up with the idea. One day you may be the leader because you have the idea, the next day you might be cooking a meal and being uh, somewhat invisible in your service. And so we always have the choice. What is the cloak that you wish to wear? All cloaks uh, will lead you to evolution. All of them. Victim and victimizer, uh, leader and follower. And they will all eventually uh, pull away your illusions and, and bring to you uh, the picture of truth. So, let us go from this place together uh, and know that we are a tribe, we are a community, we are a soul family, we are soul friends, and yet each one of us is the source. Each one of us sits in this place. I'm just sitting here for the moment. Mm -hmm. Any of you could be sitting in this place, and that when you leave this room, you are indeed the one who sits in this place. So let your mind imagine what is the highest expression of this. Is it to be compassionate with a stranger? Is it to make a joke? Is it to let the other guy pass in the car? Is it to dream something? So be your true selves and carry it into the world because that's the mandate on the planet. <laughs>